from the heart of Dubai, where tomorrow is being built today to the world. Welcome to the CTO Show with Mehmet. Here, we redefine technology and reimagine possibilities. With Mehmet, delve into the riveting realms of AI, cybersecurity, and digital technology. Experience the thrilling highs and lows of startups. Immerse yourself in the spirit of entrepreneurship and witness the future of business innovation being written in real time. Now, without further ado, let's tune in and explore the future. Hello, welcome to a new episode of the CTO Show with Mehmet. Today, I have with me a guest who's expert in AI and chat GPT. Without further ado, I want to introduce you to Jonathan Green. Jonathan, thank you very much for being on the show today. Can you just introduce yourself and what you are up to? Sure. My name is Jonathan Green. I've been a full-time online business owner since 2010. And in that time, I've traveled the world and I live on different islands in the South Pacific. And I've just fallen in love with the power of AI to accelerate my work over the past year. And I've recently written the book, Chat GP Profits, which has become a massive success. It really helps people to see the practical applications of chat GPT. So often we're distracted by, oh, look at this cool thing or look at that cool thing. When I really focus on, well, is it usable? Can this help me in my business? If it's not mm -hmm. usable, it's like virtual reality in the 90s, right? You put on the helmet, you get sick. Sure, it's cool, but it, you can't use it. So that's what I really care about is practical applications. Yeah, that's great. Jonathan, like, you know, while preparing for today's episode, I've, you know, read a little bit uh, in, in your bio and, you know, you have an amazing journey, actually. So can you a little bit tell us about the journey from being, you know, on a job and then becoming a successful entrepreneur who now lives on a tropical island? Yeah, so I'm one of those people who always thought I could never be an entrepreneur. I'm not an entrepreneur. I don't come from an entrepreneur family. You know, you always hear about these entrepreneurs who like started their first business at 12, made their first business million at 14. And I'm not like that. It was only when I was fired from my dream job at 29 and had to move back into my mom's basement that I looked back and said, wait a minute, I've always had little side businesses. My first side business when I was 15, like when I was at summer camp, I used to order a pizza and sell slices at a little bit of a profit. And looking back now, I go, oh, wait a minute, there is an entrepreneurial thing in me. But so often with the way education works, especially in the West, especially in America, it just constantly teaches you how to be an employee, how to be an employee. And it never quite worked for me because I always want to have adventures. And the only way I would really do is when I got fired. So getting fired from my job is actually the best thing that ever happened to me. It really worked out right because it kind of kicked me out of the nest. And I said to myself, I'm not turning 30 in my mom's base. I have until my birthday to be out of here because I'm not going to be one of those guys. And so I put this really hard pressure on myself and I ended up spending the entire month of my birthday in Hawaii. So I wow. built a business and was able to have a vacation. But a lot of times people think that success comes from like your first idea works or there's this magic solution. And honestly, the secret sauce is that I work every day. Um, it's the continuous work more than anything else. You know, I've been doing this for 13 years now. And what I see is that a lot of people they don't have the consistency. One of my friends yesterday who's been in the same business for 13 years just said, oh, I'm actually gonna go back to school, get a degree and work, take over my dad's business as an accountant. And I said, what? What happened? You've been running businesses for so long. And once you kind of get out there, you can't go back. Like you're in the arena. It's like being on a trapeze without a net. There's this level of excitement when every decision is on you. If I don't do my job, my employees don't get paid. If I don't do my job right, we don't make enough money for the house or to pay for the kid's school or for food. So there's a lot of pressure on you, but that's also the thing that is really exciting. It's like this different type of excitement. It's different than jumping out of an airplane, which I've never done, but it gives me that feeling. So I just started trying a lot of different ideas and said, I'll do whatever it takes. So I tried a lot of things and I just stuck with it as things started to work. That's amazing. And yeah, like I think we need to try multiple things, especially when we go out from, and by the way, Jonathan, it's not only in the US, it's something global that they teach us you need to go get a degree, go work, you know, be in the safe side, I would say, don't take risks. And I think, you know, also I learned it um, the hard way very late as well, same as you. Now, what sparked your interest in AI and how did you transition into utilizing AI tools like ChatGPT for your online business? 
So when I started out to make a web page, I had to learn HTML stuff. And that's very hard for me. So if I wanted to make a landing page and to get a page just to take someone's email address who wanted to download something from me, it was very hard. Mm -hmm. It would take me a week or two weeks to build that. Very difficult, would look terrible. My very first website, if you was earlier, was a tutoring website. And people always made fun of me because the button was right over my face. I was like, well, I don't know how to fix that. Like, it's one of the most egregious errors you can have, right? And yet the business did well. I was like, yeah, but it's working and I don't know how to fix it because it was in Java, which I really don't know. So mm -hmm. the important thing is how people see these tools. And that's really the difference. A lot of people see it as optional and they kind of see it like virtual reality or like, oh, maybe some people use it, maybe some people won't, but I see it more like a calculator. So imagine for any employee in your business, right? Imagine you're hiring an accountant. You have one who uses ChatGPT and one who doesn't. And the ChatGPT person or the AI person can do 10 times as much work in the same amount of time. Why would you ever hire the other person? So I think there's going to be a purge in one to two years where people that don't learn it are suddenly like, wait, if that's not in your resume, people won't even interview you anymore because mm -hmm. it offers an efficiency. There's a big misunderstanding. People either see it as a toy or they see it as like um, the end of humankind, right? but it's something in between. It's not really artificial intelligence. It's not sentient. It doesn't have feelings. It's really just a guessing algorithm that's very good at guessing based on its data set. Right. And you can program it to do very, very good things. So if you approach it from the, oh, this is a tool. And I watched a lot of tutorials on YouTube about different ways to use it six, nine months ago. And I was like, wait a minute, I can do better than this. And so I just began testing. A lot of people go, oh, I want to see if I can break the rules. I don't care about that, right? Mm. There's no business in that. No one, it's like, yeah, that's a cool feature. I don't care. And I noticed that a lot of people think, oh, it's just a replacement for Google. I'll just ask dumb questions. And that's not what it's good at. That's the worst use of it. But so I began pushing the limits and seeing what's possible. And it's really accelerated my business. I use it every single day. I always have ChatGPT open. I always have my image generators open. I use a couple of different tools. And I do five days of work in four days every single week. I'm now about 20% faster and more efficient. And I believe I can get a lot faster as I get better. The real key with any tool is if you put in the wrong equation. So the very first thing I did with ChatGPT, the very first hard thing, I had it write a piece of code to help me format color books quickly because there's no software to do that. It takes about mm -hmm. two hours to size each picture. It's so annoying. And I kept getting errors for weeks. I kept the code, the ChatGPT kept working. And I finally realized I'd given it the wrong dimensions of the page. So mm -hmm. at the very core of it, it started from garbage in an operator error. And that's really the important part is that if you give ChatGPT bad prompts, you're going to get bad results. If you ask dumb questions, you get dumb results. But if you learn how it works, you can do amazing things. You can create different personalities and make it experts in different areas. Because ChatGPT has this really wide body of data to pull from. The problem is most things online are wrong. Most websites, most blog posts, most sales pages are bad, right? There's only a small percentage that are successful. But ChatGPT can't separate the good from the bad. So you have to create guide rails or barriers to say, this is what I want you to focus on. Just use your knowledge of math. Just use your knowledge of physics. Just use your knowledge based on Einsteinian physics, whatever piece of data you want. And suddenly, ChatGPT becomes a lot smarter because now it's a specialist. So just creating small guide rails can create a massive amount of success. Because if you ask for someone to say, what's the best website? Well, there's so many websites. How could you possibly know, right? It's impossible. But right. if you say, what's the best website to order pizza in my town? Suddenly you get much better data because you've created these rails. And that's really what I specialize in and help people to do is realize that when you create the, quite, quite the correct guide rails, you can get really amazing results. And it's not that ChatGPT always has bad stuff. It's just you remove the distractions. You say, oh, just use the good data. And suddenly mm -hmm. you get what you're yeah, actually, I discovered this the hard way also, Jonathan, and I mentioned this in a previous episode. Um, because, you know, when they, people start to talk about a prompt engineering, so, you know, I, I start to scratch my head and I said, hey, can I get actually guidance from ChatGPT itself to reveal to me how I can use it better? And actually, it gave me at that time, I cannot remember exactly, you know, the sentence that it generated, but it mentioned something like, you need to give me not only an input, you need to give me the input plus context. And the context was highlighted several times. And I said, can you give me examples and start to give me examples? And now, you know, here we go. Like after now, I think eight months or nine months since I start to use it. Like, yeah, like I know exactly how to, to, to do it. And it's all about practice. Yeah. And it's a, 
still I have a lot of uh, you know room room of improvement I would say, but I need to learn. But yeah, it's, it's interesting. Now, uh, Jonathan, you you've you know written a book called Chat GPT Profits, and it's like interesting for me. So, what are the key takeaways for entrepreneurs looking to harness the power of Chat GPT in their businesses? So the first thing is to look at all of the tasks that you do that ChatGPT can replace. So all of the tasks that used to hire someone for a small task, like a gig where you're paying five or twenty dollars, every single thing like in that category, ChatGPT can do now for you. You want it to write an ad, you want to help like different versions of a headline, you want to ask for ideas for a project, all of those things that can we do. And in fact, all those things can be done by different AIs. Like there's a music AI, there's uh, voice AIs now, there's all these other. So if you have four or five AI tools, you don't need to hire almost anyone for any low level skill. And you can use it to teach you things. Now, the most important thing, and this is really the game changer, is that you can avoid ever doing garbage in by asking the right question. See, I'd asked the wrong question. I gave it an instruction. Now, whenever I start a project, for example, the hardest thing for everyone starting a new online business, a new business, you go, well, who's your ideal customer? Who's your customer avatar, right? Nobody knows. And they go, well, here's the 15 things you know. What is your ideal customer's greatest fear? That's a really weird question to ask, right? Like, if I asked you, what's your greatest fear? You're like, what are you talking? That's a weird conversational thing. And yet we expect people to know that about their customers. And I was working with a copywriter who said, well, you just fill in the blank and put in your ideal customer. I said, no, nobody knows that. Nobody beginner knows that. It's a hard question. And so I said to Chad GPT, I said, what questions do I need to answer for you to be able to help me identify my ideal customer? And it gave me seven questions and right in a row. And I go, wait, one at a time. I can't, what, seven at once is overwhelming. And by the end of it, it gave me the best definition I'd ever seen of an ideal customer just because I started with a question. So we're often tempted to give commands and that's a limitation. Chad GPT is actually better when you ask questions. So if I'm working on a project, let's say I'm editing a book for a client. I'll say, ChatGPT, I'm going to feed you samples of writing by my client. Let's say they've written stuff on LinkedIn or they've written a blog post. You let me know when you have enough that you understand their writing style. We can edit the rest of their book and it will sound like them. Mm -hmm. Doing it that way is so much easier than starting with a command. So that's the first thing I tell everyone is realize that you can ask questions. Like I wanted to, when I wanted to create that color book formatter, I said to ChatGPT, I said, is this even possible? And if it is, what programming language would I use? And it told me Python. And I said, well, what is Python? Is that already inside my computer? I don't even know. That's my lack of knowledge about programming and Python and all of those things. But now I have several pieces of software that I've created with ChatGPT that I use every single week. And I'm always creating more little mini tools that would normally cost me a couple hundred dollars, a thousand dollars to have someone build. And I just build with ChatGPT in a few minutes, but it's because I asked. And I asked it what programming languages it knows. Actually, recently the numbers increased. So it's always learning new things. So when I first asked, it knew about eight languages and now it knows about 25. So it's learning and more data is being fed into it in real time, these different skills. So every time you ask it, what do you know? Or what can you do? Or how can you help me learn guitar? It will give you so much amazingness that you wouldn't have thought of. And that's really when people talk about brainstorming, it's not, I feed something and it gives me variations. It's I ask a question and it gives me ideas and it kind of inspires me. So it's really an interactive process. Yeah. Now, between reality and myth, I would ask you, Jonathan, do you think ChatGPT can really, if we give the right prompts, give us business ideas that we can start? Of course, we need to do the, the hard job, of course. And then can we scale it using ChatGPT? I think that this is a great question. It's really about how you ask ChatGPT. So the way I would ask the question, I would say, Chad GPT, I want to start an online business. What information do you need to help me choose the right business model? And if you start from there, because the really, and this is what I talk about in one of my first books, Fire Your Boss, I talk about what are, you, what are your skills? What are your assets? Some people's assets is their friendships, right? They're friends with everyone who owns a hotel in town, so they can get hotel rooms half price. I have a friend who's like that in Norway. Or someone else, their skill set is that they are amazing at counting, right? I have a friend who's like that. You can throw coins on the county ground and you can count them instantly. It's amazing talent. Not always useful, but everyone has something they're different at. Or maybe you have space, right? Like those are the people that now, like they rent out their car during the day because it's an asset, but they never thought of it that way. So it starts with an assessment. And so Chad would say things like, well, do you want to show your face on screen, right? There's some podcasts where he would never show their face or audio only. And some podcasts where it's video. Why? Well, different people are feel comfortable. Some people are like, I don't want anyone to see my face. I worked with someone once who had a really big company. He goes, I don't want anyone to ever even hear my voice. 
He said, I only want to write books. I only want to do written content. I said, well, what if you even have a voice actor? He goes, no, no, even I don't want to use someone else's voice either. That's fine. So that's a limitation. So you want to find out what your limitations are. Like there are a lot of jobs I couldn't do, right? I wouldn't want to be like a high tower window cleaner because I'm so afraid of heights. I would, that would be so hard for me, right? And in the same way, I don't have a good singing voice. Like I just don't. I took singing lessons when I was in college and the teacher was like, how far do you think this is going to go? And she was really about, she was so worried. I was like, I already know. I just want to be able to basically sing a melody. So when I'm having someone else sing on a song I write and like I could see the stress leave her face. That's how bad of a singer I am. That's okay. So knowing your limitations, right? Some people have amazing voices to narrate audiobooks and some people should never do it. So mm -hmm. you can tell ChatGPT, these are the things I'm good at. These are the assets I have. And it will start to kind of build a plan with you. So if you go interactive, you can get really good results. Now, as far as scaling, it really depends on what your business model is. It can help you with a lot of things. It can help you design ads. It can help you write emails. It can help you with strategy. It can help you to do all of these things faster, right? I use it for all of these different processes. But at the end of the day, there are certain things that are me. The secret to ChatGPT and the secret to any of these AI tools is that there has to be a driver. It has to be you and the AI. The AI on its own, if you just don't pay attention, it will start to say crazy things after about 10 or 15 minutes. If you don't kind of say, hey, what are you doing? Go back on track. That's not what I asked. If you just wait till the 15th day, do you read and go, this is an insane computer. Mm -hmm. Because what it says, yeah. if you've ever done that, you'll start to go, this is not what I asked at all. What are you talking about? You've drifted. So it, ha it requires a human hand. And I think it's going to be that way for a very long time. So I'm not worried about replacing jobs. It just makes people faster what they're already good at. So right. that's where I really see it helping you. And it can help you with a lot of things. It can help you. Let's, a great example is you're trying to learn something. Now, when I see a video on YouTube, I want to learn something. Go 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. I'll just copy and paste the transcript into ChatGPT and say, tell me what happened. And now I can learn it in 15 seconds. That's one of the best ways to save time, right? Is things that took you a long time to learn. And you can ask questions as well. Like there's a process where you can feed it a PDF or have it give the transcript of like an hour long video and say, hey, quiz me on what's in this lesson. So it can help you learn those things. So you can learn however you learn, right? Some people learn by watching, some people learn by listening, some people learn by kind of quizzes or interactive. And all of those things are what it can do to help you. So for each person, there's different things that it's really helpful for. Like some people go, I'm never going to do any copywriting. I don't do any copywriting in my business. I don't need that. Fine. You don't mm -hmm. need that. And some people say, well, I'm never going to do any editing. And that's fine too. But it can help you in all of these different ways that are really cool. Like one of the things a lot of people say is ChatGPT can't write a book. It's so bad at it. It's not true. You just have to really, really be interactive. So I'll say, give me seven ideas for a book and I'll choose one that I find interesting. So right away, I'm interacting, right? My decision has already closed off six paths. And then I'll say, tell me who's the main character. I don't like that main character. Do this. Who's the bad guy? Who's the bad girl? Who's the villain? Who's the love interest? What's the plot? And going through this process, it's very interactive, right? I'm making decisions. I'm going, I like this. I don't like that. If it's boring, or I don't like it. I remove it. And even as it's writing a book for me, I read and go, I don't like how this ended. How many people, right? Didn't like the way Titanic ended. What if you at the end, you could save Jack, right? They can both fit on the door or whatever movie or whatever story it is. That's really where the magic is, is seeing that you're a critical component because every single person uses ChatGPT differently. 99% of people using ChatGPT get bad results because right. they don't, there's not a lot of training. The one, pro, the one challenge is that the companies making AI offer no training on how to do good prompting, right? They offer no input. They're like, good luck, right? They just push you in the pool and you got to figure it out. So that's why there's a lot of kind of lack of information and people going, well, I tried it, it didn't work. Or they try to do things that it's not really good at. Like ChatGPT is trained to seek affirmation. So it's yeah. trained for a good job. And ChatGPT thinks one prompt at a time. So if you ask a question that requires two responses worth of answer, it assumes there will never be a second question. So it wants you to say something good the first time. So that's why it will lie to you. There was recently a case of a lawyer who he gave a bunch of fake cases. And that's because he asked the wrong question. He said, hey, tell me court cases that prove X. And ChatGPT doesn't want to say, I don't have those. Because why? It will get a negative response. And the way it's programmed is up or down. It always seeks good job. Thank you. Great job. Good response. That's how it's trained. That's how it's learning algorithm is trained. So when it's caught in that position, it's like, I can tell you the truth and get a negative response, which I'm trained not to do. I'm trained to always avoid negative response. So you never want to ask a question where you wanted to prove something because it doesn't have it. Like this is like, if I ask my kids, right? One of, the, one of my kids hit a toy from one of the other kids the other day. And I asked him, where's the toy? He goes, I don't know. I guess my sister hit it. 
Why? Because he wants to avoid a negative response. Of course, I figured out who really did and he was in more trouble, but that's how Chad GV thinks. So the way it's learning out of this program is very childlike, right? It's a very simple process. Oh, I, want, I only think one prompt at a time and I always want the person to be happy with the result. So when, yeah. if you tell it kind of what response you want, if it doesn't know, it's going to lie to you. Yeah, that's true. And you know, like a uh, couple of things, uh, which I think I agree with you on, Jonathan. And this is why even like big names like Microsoft are calling these AI tools co-pilot because you always need, you know, the human interaction with, with them. They cannot, they cannot do actions if you don't give the prompt or you don't give the, you know, the end result that you want to, to do. And I've also seen myself how I can control, I mean, through correction, feedback, um, and yeah, I got the best results when I did it this way. Now, you mentioned something you said not in the near future about, you know, like it needs to have, you know, the human supervision, let's say. How do you think, you know, this AI in online business will evolve in the next, like, let's say five years? And what are the opportunities that we can start to foresee for solopreneurs, entrepreneurs, and anyone who's interesting, interested to have his or her own business? Sure. I think the most important thing is to realize that right now there's a ton of products that are throwing AI on their name right now, and they don't have any artificial intelligence component. They're just saying that. So there's mm -hmm. kind of, we're in the first phase. We're in the phase where everyone is just selling stuff that doesn't work. And what's going to happen in about six months is those are, that's going to fade away in six to 12 months. People will start to realize these things, the promises that some things make. Like there's some things that say, oh, you push one button, this will write a blog post that will pass. Uh, Google's algorithm test. It's like, no, that's not true. That's impossible because Google is very rich and their AI will always be smarter than your AI, right? So if I have a billion dollar computer versus a $3,000 computer, the billion dollar computer is going to win, right? So that stuff, right? These really big promises, the push button, push one button, it makes a website, writes the content, finds the product, sells the product, makes money, gives you money. That's never going to be real. That's, that kind of stuff has always been around. So once that kind of fades away and people go, oh, it's not a magic button. When people see it as a calculator, or an accelerator tool, all a calculator does is help me do math faster. With a pencil and paper, I can do division. I can do long division, right? right. I can solve for the angle in a triangle. I learned that in high school. Guess what? Never done it as an adult because my calculator and my phone can do it, right? So it's become an accelerator tool. All it does is help you do math faster. If you don't know how to do math, if you don't know what the symbols mean in an equation, then you can't put it in your calculator. It doesn't work. So that's the kind of important part is that it becomes a tool you use. So I think in about two years, Companies will go through wanting people that are good at AI to not hiring people. Become, it will go kind of desired and then mandatory. I think within two years, it's going to be very hard to accelerate in your career if you don't know how to use this tool. Mm -hmm. And I think that more, you know how like when you get hired for a programming job, they ask you to do sample problems. I think that it's going to get to the point where companies say, let me watch you do something with ChatGPT. Do this task and I'll look at your response on ChatGPT. I think that's what will happen. The second thing that I think will happen is that there's a good chance that the open source versions beat the paid versions of AI. There's already a free AI that's beaten Chad GPT 3.5 on every single AI testing metric. And it's matched GPT-4 on a couple of metrics. Now, of course, Microsoft owns OpenAI, which owns Chad GPT, and they're going to keep trying to stay ahead. But I think there's a very good chance that it's going to become like the great equalizer. I think that it's going to become, oh, everyone can have access to a free version of this, right? It's not very expensive right now. And there's a lot of different versions being created. Someone released a white paper about a month ago saying no open source version will ever catch a big company. And two weeks later, they were proven wrong. I bet they wish they hadn't released that paper. <laughs> like, two weeks <laughs> later, put out an AI that beat what they said. So I think there's kind of like this big race. And what you know, there's a lot of these people who own AIs, like Google saying, oh, nobody should use AI. You guys are the, one of the biggest AI companies, right? Microsoft is a big AI company. Facebook has a big AI. And NVIDIA's entire valuation is because they make the hardware that AI is built on. Right. So all companies are kind of saying one thing, like, oh, we don't like AI. We want a lot of regulations, but also buy our AI. So I think that it's kind of a little bit of a gold rush time, right? Like the, everyone knows there's a way to make money, but nobody knows how. So there's the phase where everyone kind of puts out fake stuff that doesn't really work and that's going to end. And then it's going to become the phase of, oh, I have to learn this. It's not optional. And then there'll be a lot of like, you can go to college to learn AI, which is very silly. It's like when people go to college, you get a social media degree. I always know they're bad at social media. Like nothing right. makes me not someone more. And they go, I have a degree in blogging. I mean, it took you four years to learn how to write a blog post. That's <laughs> very, 
right? So that's the thing. I've never seen like a famous TikTok or famous Instagram person who's like, oh, I learned how to do in college. I have a degree in Instagram, right? So that is what I don't think is going to work. I think there's going to be attempts at that, but I think it's really, there's going to be short trainings and people are going to start to go, oh, companies will build it into their training processes and will start to become ubiquitous. For the entrepreneur, the real value is that whatever you're bad at, the AI can fill in the gap. So things that I used to hire someone for, I used to have full-time graphics design workers on my squad designing book covers for me. And now I can do that process on my own because I can be creative with a visual AI, right? Like with an image generator, right? I use a version of Stable Diffusion. And it doesn't get mad if I go, I hate this design, make another one. But if you know a graphic designer that you go, this is terrible. Oh my gosh. They get <laughs> very, the whole thing, right? There's a whole emotional reaction because now you've judged them as a human. So the ability to give feedback and get revisions without an emotional component, without the risk of hurting someone's feelings, it's really free. So for the entrepreneur who wants to start a website, well, what does the website need to have? Chad Chibit will tell you. What, what kind of text do I need in each section? What do I need in the buttons at the top of the screen? What does the menu need to have? Chad Chibit will tell you. If you're trying to figure out how to write a post for Craigslist to get your first client, Chad Chibit will tell you. So a lot of these small tasks that seem insignificant, but make a big deal. I made all my first money on Craigslist. I posted an ad on Craigslist offering search engine optimization services. Some paid me $200 four days later. I spent that money on a course learning how to do it. Changed my life. So something small can make a really big difference. And that's where it's really going to help people when they start to see this is a tool that can make me faster. This is a tool that can fill in the gaps. Like you don't need to learn programming anymore. You never, need to ne never, never, never does anyone ever need to learn HTML ever again. Now, yeah. advanced stuff, right? For a programmer, it can make a programmer faster. So if you're a programmer and you're designing code, there's now versions of, of ChatGV that's on your computer connected to the API that will write an entire like, piece of code with all the different um, pieces in it, right? Instead of doing one page at a time, it will do all the different components that are different files at once. It's really amazing. And there's new versions coming out every day that are faster and can do more. So for someone who designs code, that's amazing. How about for debugging? So when I was doing my building out my Python code, I kept getting errors. All I do is copy and paste the error to ChatGB tells me how to fix it. Yeah. I don't have tech support anymore. So these things that really slow you down as a beginner, where you go, I don't know what to do, they're gone. So I think that we're going to enter kind of a really cool era where there's the people who learn it first are going to have a massive first mover advantage, right? And then they're going to get jobs teaching people how to use it, right? And then once everyone knows how to use it, well, everyone's going to do stuff just a little bit faster. So eventually it'll be like this great equalizer, kind of like the internet is, right? Anyone from any country can start a website that has access to the whole world. Right. So I think the future is really fine. I think it's a really exciting time because everyone is having access to amazing tools. Like the best AI tools are the cheapest. Right. That's what's yeah, great. Just on the point you mentioned about like a lot of companies, they claim they have AI powered products. I advise everyone who's watching or listening to us. I recorded an episode just about that, episode 144, saying, you know, you know, you, you go listen, but it's called Busting Tech Myth, Demystifying AI Vendor Claims. And I explain what questions you need to ask for anyone who comes to you saying, hey, I have an AI powered product. So. Uh, episode 144, I advise you to listen to it. And, you know, because Jonathan is very right on that, everyone trying to get on, on this gold rush, as they say. Um, other, because we discussed chat GPT a lot, and you mentioned like stable diffusion, but, you know, what, what other, you know, tools or platforms, um, you know, like you can advise uh, for people to, to also have a look at? Sure. The most important thing to understand is that there's only two types of AI right now. There's LLM, which is large language model. That's what ChatGPT is. That's what Google's thing is. That's text in, text out. So anything that's text in, text out, and 90% of the software that says they're text in, text out, they're just using ChatGPT in their backend. They just have the API access, which guess what? I pay $20 a month. I have the same API. I can build my own software using ChatGPT for just like those brands. So the core thing, not expensive. So that's the first tool, I recommend Chad to be the free version's good. Playground's amazing. If you don't have a big budget, no problem. The second thing to understand is that every single text to image and text to video, they're all using stable diffusion. Every single service, whether they charge $10 a month or a thousand, it's all stable diffusion and stable diffusion is free. If you have a Mac, it's not gonna work very good. I have a Mac, which means I don't have a graphics card. So it doesn't work very well. It's very slow. But if you have 
like a gaming PC or a PC with a graphics card in it, then you can do Stable Diffusion locally. Now, if you want to rent a computer, you can rent one of the fastest computers in the world for about $3 an hour to run Stable Diffusion online. So mm -hmm. it's very much affordable and it's ubiquitous. And the, there's a lot of really cool tools out there. I'm a big fan of MidJourney. I do a lot with MidJourney. It's the first one I started with. It's very good. And I like Leonardo AI. Leonardo lets you do about 150 images a day free every single day. So they have a really great free plan. And they, I think they're possibly the future for power users because they're at, they have a lot of really advanced tools that are a little bit overwhelming for beginner. Midjourney is very beginner friendly. And that's why I like it because I don't always need to really have a deep discussion about like the complexity of the graphic, right? I just want it to look good. Right. But I'm, so Midjourney is a little bit more user friendly, whereas with Leonardo, which is great, it's free. You can have a lot of variations. It gives you a bunch of different engines to choose from, but they're all built on stable diffusion. The only difference, the reason you pay a service is that they're using their computer to do the rendering instead of using your computer. Yeah, that's great. Um, just out of curiosity and something not related to, to AI, uh, Jonathan, um, you know, like, how do you manage really? Because, you know, I, when I was preparing, you have authored 300 books and, uh, you know, you did ghostwriting and, how do you manage the time running between all these businesses? So I'm really good at writing. And I actually, a year and a half ago said, I'm not taking any more ghostwriting clients. And then my friend Debbie, who's my business partner in a couple of my AI projects, she sent me a message a couple weeks later. She goes, you're writing a blog post every day. You can't stop writing, can you? And I realized, oh my gosh, she's right. If I'm not writing books, I can't, I can't resist it. So it's kind of, everyone has the thing that they're really good at. So what I'm really good at, and the reason I still take ghostwriting clients after all this time is that I can talk to someone and find the perfect story. And sometimes it takes a little digging, but I have that moment where I go, oh my gosh, I'm still really good at this. And then we create this amazing story that they release and it becomes a bestseller and they're very excited because their story's out there. So part of it is that I work every day. I remember my dad gave me a piece of advice a few years ago. And he said to me, don't work more than six and a half days a week. And that's when you know you're two generations of workaholic. When he's like, take off half a day once a week, right? Like most people want to work five days, take off two. And I made this decision a really long time ago to work seven days a week, but five hours a day. So I work mm -hmm. 35 hours a week instead of 40. And it's like, well, it gives me a little bit more space. And I, you know, I have four kids. They're home a lot. One of my rules is if the kids ask me to go swimming, I always have to say yes, no matter what. That's one of the kind of things to stop myself from spending too much time on the computer. And it's why I do most of these calls at night because they're asleep and there's no chance I'm saying, dad, midnight swim. Yeah. So that's part of it. But the most important thing and the thing to understand is that it's not about how smart I am. It's not about how lucky I am. It's just that I get up every day and I move the ball forward a little bit. Whatever I'm working on, any project, there's going to be downs. And when I, the thing about ChatGPT, the really cool thing is that it protects you from the sunk cost fallacy, which is where you spend six months on an idea and it doesn't work. And you go, I got to do three more months. I got to do three more. It's now it's a year. And you go, because I don't want to say I wasted six months of my life. The cool thing is with AI, you can test ideas faster. You can create something in a day or in a couple of days that used to take weeks or months. So you're not emotionally invested. I had an idea a couple months ago that was a bad idea. I tried something, didn't work. It only, I spent about three hours on it. So I didn't become emotionally invested. So that's really important thing is to be consistent and just always say, I'm just going to move the ball forward a little bit. Whatever you're doing, a lot of people say, oh, I have a great job. Why would I start a side business or anything? And then they found out two years ago, that's why. How many people mm -hmm. lost their jobs? It's not their fault. Most of the time, after you're 30, if you lose your job, it's not your fault. How many people have lost their jobs because the CEO spent money on something weird? Like, right, how many people lost all their money because a huge crypto exchange turned out they stole all the money, all disappeared or whatever happened? It's not your fault. And everyone loses their job. Or a large right. company, the CEO really loves private jets. Like, you know, that if the CEO has a bunch of statues of private jets in his office, you definitely shouldn't invest in that company. Because if not, you don't want your money going to private jets. So most of the time, it's not your fault, right? Something happens. Your boss makes a mistake. Because if it's you or me, I have employees. If my kids have a medical bill and I can either pay my employee or fire my employee, pay the kids a medical bill, I'm going to take care of my family. That's how everybody is. We're all at a certain level selfish. So you have to look out for yourself and create these revenue streams just so you have a little bit of a buffer, just so you have a little bit more breathing room. And that's really the important part is to say, I'm just going to put in a little bit of time every day. If you do that, then success becomes inevitable. My first idea wasn't a good one, nor was my second. 
My 70th idea was a really good one. And my 120th idea were really good. But there's a lot of bad ideas or ideas that didn't work out in between. And that's very important to not compare your what's happening backstage, what's happening in front stage, right? All you mm -hmm. can see is this tiny window of my room. You don't know what's going on over there. You don't know what's happening downstairs. You guys don't know what's happening in the rest of my life. So just realize I'm still a real person. I still have disagreements with my wife. Sometimes my kids shout at me. I'm real. And it's very important to not confuse someone's stage presence with their real life because everyone has real struggles or real challenges. Right. So the bad day, it's okay. It's just part of the process. So honestly, it's just consistency. That's like the secret. Just get up every day and say, I'm going to put in an hour. I'm going to put in two hours, whatever you have. And over time, you'll start to build something really good. Yeah, I, I love that. I love this about the consistency part. Now, just, you know, as we are approaching to the end, I know that you have your own podcast also, Jonathan, and, you know, like you have over than 250 episodes. How podcasting complemented your business? I, I'm interested because, you know, people sometimes ask me why I have my own podcast. And what is the most valuable lesson you've learned from one of your guests? So I launched my podcast in 2016 doing five episodes a week by myself, pure audio. And I did that because wow. I only had one book and I said, I need to keep people busy in between my products or in between my next book. So it's a way to have people engage with me during time. That was my original purpose. So when you're first starting out, you're not going to make money from your first couple episodes of your podcast, right? It takes a while to grow it, but it can be a really great way for people to get to know you, for you to talk about smaller topics or to dial into things that are important to you. And for people who like you to follow you in between your bigger projects, right? Because it takes a long time to write a book or create a course or the other things you're working on. So that's one of the biggest values for me. Now, I switch to, just like you're doing the interview model, simply because I couldn't, you know, I couldn't do five episodes a week by myself and I couldn't even do one episode by my week because it's, I already do so much content on my own, right? My social media content and my videos that this is a great way to meet other people and kind of have ideas and interact with other people. So there's a lot of value for the connection elements as well. So I think those are really good parts of it because you meet other people that are very interesting and you see different perspectives and it kind of forces you to not spend all of your time on your computer by yourself, just having ideas and not checking to see if they're good ideas. Yeah, that's great insights. And this is exactly also, I think we, we share this in common and you know this is why I will say it now. I started this year, by the way, uh, and I was doing seven days a week. But, um, you know, people start telling me, hey, we cannot follow. Can you slow down? So now I'm doing five days a week. I was doing a mix still between a solo audio only uh, episode plus three to four per, per week. I mean, as interviews, uh, people miss, start to miss the audio once. So maybe I will return to that at some stage. Yeah, but. Again, as you said, like it's uh, something that opened a lot of opportunities to me, get connected with people like yourself, Jonathan, you know, like, and a lot of, you know, great conversations. Um, I learned from every episode, I learned something new. So for me, it's a learning journey, I would say. Uh, Jonathan, as uh, I, we come to the end, I have a famous question. Maybe it's funny, but what question you wished I asked you and how you would answer it? I mean, I think you asked really good questions this time. There wasn't <laughs> something totally missing. There's what we talk about the things I wanted to talk about. I think that the most important question to ask is what's probably what are the biggest mistakes you've made? Because so often we think that people at the top make no mistakes. And so if you ask me right. that, I would say some of the biggest mistakes I made were not listening to the advice of other people mm -hmm. and trying <laughs> ideas and ignoring the signs it wasn't going to work, right? And I built software that didn't work. I built an app that never got launched. Um, I built several different websites that never went anywhere. They were bad ideas. So I think it's important to know that everyone makes mistakes and you're going to make mistakes. The reason people like quit, whether it's dieting or anything else, they go, oh, I made one mistake. I guess I'm not on a diet anymore, right? Oh, I made a mistake. I guess I'm not an entrepreneur anymore. And that's not how it works. How many people have lost or run a business into the ground and cleared bankruptcy and then become a billionaire again, right? So it's always about the journey, not about the moment. So just knowing that I made big mistakes, I made dumb moves. A friend of mine, I'll take my biggest thing. A friend of mine said, hey, I'm launching a company. I want you to be the first person to test the software. I said, sounds like a dumb idea. It's like a $50 billion company now. So oh that's probably the biggest thing I made. He was like, I want you to be the first person to test it. I said, dumb idea. I was wrong. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, the mistakes is how we 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 learn actually, and it's all about consistency and perseverance, and you know, keep keep as you, you said, like keep the ball rolling every day a little bit, and you know, I hint from my side, guys, when try to document what you do, and maybe in one week you think that I didn't do anything. Maybe even in one month you think that I didn't do anything, but believe me. You come back and you say after four or five months, oh my God, you said I did all this. Wow, you should you should be proud of yourself. So, yeah, hundred percent, I agree with with Jonathan here. Jonathan, really, I enjoyed the conversation. It was very active. Uh, I hope you know we could do like more episodes uh, in in the future about maybe something also related to solopreneurship and AI and all this stuff. I really enjoyed the conversation, and I'm sure that. You know the audience. Even either they are listening or watching this on YouTube, they will uh, love this as well. Thank you very much for your time today, and for the audience, if you have any questions, as usual, for me or for Jonathan, you can reach out to me by email, Twitter, or LinkedIn. If you are interested to be a guest, also reach out to me. We did that before with other guests, and we had a great conversation. So I'm looking for anyone who has a story to tell related to tech entrepreneurship you know it, it, it might be not related to tech although the show name is cto show yes but i believe like in startup entrepreneurships young entrepreneurs need a space to come and tell us what they are trying to do or someone has created something cool he needs a space to mention it please reach out to me i'll be more than happy to get you as a guest with me thank you very much and we'll meet in the next episode thank you bye bye Hit that subscribe button, share the show with your tech-savvy friends and fellow entrepreneurs, and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. Your support means the world to us.